The three brothers born and raised in Sacramento. They own and operate a facility here in Sacramento working with adult fitness and athletes, mainly baseball and softball athletes. So it's coming from a place, this uh, specific presentation, and a practical later, coming from a place of three brothers that coach their ass off. And I couldn't be more excited to have a local group in here because we're all about bringing it together and no better way than to bring the local talent and bring it to the stage. So without further ado, Joe Grinstein. How's it going, everybody? Um, so like Ram said, my name is Joseph Grinstein. I'm here representing Hyperthrive Athletics. First off, I do want to thank Ram um, for putting this event together and thank his team. I would have been grateful just to be here in attendance because last year was such an amazing experience. Um, but it is truly an honor to be up here speaking with all of you guys. Um, but the entire King staff, puts on this event, thank you guys so much. To all the other speakers, it's an honor to share the stage with you guys. I cannot wait to learn through the, uh, the entire day. Um, and really, it's right when Ram told me, he kind of approached me about um, doing this presentation. Immediately, I was excited. And then right after that, I was nervous. And then he came out with the guest, uh, the speaker list. And man, I, I got a little bit more nervous after that. But um, you know, I am sandwiched between Max Schmarzo and Dwayne Carlisle, so I got nothing to lose. So um, I'm ready to go. Um, but first off, uh, I kind of want to introduce the topic. So today, um, it's something that we work with pretty much on a daily basis at Hyperthrive Athletics. We work with um, a ton of baseball players and softball players in the area and get the chance to work with some great athletes. So the topic for today is developing rotational power. Rotational power right there, you see that? So I want to introduce our team first. Um, so our team is quite unique. I get to work with my family on a daily basis. I get to work with my two older brothers. We've got Nolan Grinstein, our director of speed and performance, and my oldest brother, Aaron Grinstein, who is our director of operations. Um, we are born and raised in Sacramento. We grew up in Natomas, just across the river. We've actually got our parents here today. A pretty awesome experience to be here at the Golden One Center, right representing Sacramento. Um, Sacramento is my hometown team, um, so it's really, really an honor to be here. Um, I've also got my two sister-in-laws and my nephew here, so it's truly a family experience, and um, I'm just grateful that, that we're here and able to do this today, and that I get to work with my brothers every single day. So first, I just want to go over an agenda. So I want to talk about what exactly um, I intend for you guys to get out of this, the takeaways that I want you to get from this presentation. Next, we're going to talk about some evolutionary traits that have allowed humans to throw. So we're going to talk about how humans are essentially born to throw. We're going to talk about the key performance indicators of the elite, um, what separates them from the average when it comes to rotational power. We're going to use an illustration to kind of simplify that concept. We're going to talk about what, as um, strength and conditioning professionals, we can affect when it comes to rotational power. We're going to talk about the gas or the back leg. We're going to talk about the brakes or the lead leg, the trunk and uh, its role in rotational power, the upper half. And then finally, we're going to talk about optimizing our med ball work, um, which we'll also get to in our practical. So first, we're going to go to intentions and takeaways. So really, there's three things I want you guys to get out of this presentation, uh, my intention for this presentation, and it's one, to provide a better understanding of how power is generated and transferred within rotational movements. Number two, I want to explain what separates elite rotational athletes from the average. And then three, I want to show how as strength and conditioning professionals, we can enhance our athletes' athletic capabilities in order to create that elite rotational power. So first, um, it's kind of an odd way to start this, but it is a recurring conversation that happens within our gym. We work with a lot of youth athletes, and whether it's warm up or after the workout, we kind of get them having this conversation. It's happened multiple times, and it's, you know, what would happen if a lion fought a gorilla, or what would happen if, let's say, a grizzly bear fought a hippo? And um, it's always a funny conversation when you get 12-year-olds talking about it, but it's also, to me, it always makes me think, how did humans ever survive? We don't have any natural weapons. We're not all that strong. We're not all that fast. We don't have claws or strong jaws. 
how did we ever survive? And it's really interesting, um, it's some evolutionary traits that kind of allowed us, one, we got the use of our hands when we became bipedal and we um, started to walk, but then there's some evolutionary traits that have allowed us to throw with accuracy and with a little bit of power. And so some of those traits, or a few of those traits is one, we have a tall and mobile waist compared to um, some other primates, which allows for us to create hip shoulder separation. So the thorax and the pelvis, you can see there's much more space between those. Next, we have a glenohumeral joint that's more laterally oriented compared to cranially oriented, whereas a lot of primates, um, it's cranially oriented, which for them is great for climbing and swinging from trees, um, but for us, more, uh, ours is more pointed just laterally straight out to the side. And then lastly, we have um, humeral uh, torsion, which basically means that we have the ability to get into more external rotation um, and create layback on that throwing arm. And this is from a paper from um, the uh, Harvard Evolutionary Biology Department and basically they explained how throwing was not only something that um, we had the capability to do but it actually happened and it allowed us to be successful as a species. So we first saw these traits with Homo erectus about two million years ago and that's exactly when big game hunting intensified so it allows our um, species to be successful in protecting ourselves and um, hunting as well. So I thought that was really interesting when I got to uh, studying about this topic. And so now I want to talk about the research because uh, we can talk about evolution, but obviously we're strength and conditioning coaches, so we want to talk about the elite and how they do it. So this is the research when it comes to um, elite rotational athletes and specifically pitchers. So most of the data I'm gonna present is about pitchers just because that's what I'm focused on, um, but I think it can have some application across um, many athletic endeavors. So I'm definitely not a fan of having a lot of words on slides, but I think this kind of is an example of um, the complex movement that is pitching. So we've got higher ground reaction forces by the back leg, by the lead leg, front foot contact, uh, and ball release, the lead knee flexion, front tilt um, at ball release, pelvic angular velocity, trunk rotation speed, external rotation at the shoulder, elbow angle at front foot contact. We can go on and on and on. And basically the takeaway is that it is extremely complicated. It's a very complex movement and it becomes even more complex when we add into the equation the unique characteristics of every single athlete that we work with. And so a really great example of this is two athletes that we work with. On the top we've got Matt Manning. He pitches in the Detroit Tigers organization. And on the bottom we've got Jimmy Hergett who pitches in the Reds organization. Now both these athletes are elite when it comes to velocity. Um, on any given night, Matt Manning sits 94 to 97. He's an incredible, incredible athlete. Jimmy Herget um, has actually hit 101 in a game before when he pitched in the MLB Futures game. So these guys are incredible athletes and absolutely elite when it comes to pitching, but they do it in entirely different ways. So even in these pictures, we can see the difference. We've got Matt Manning over here. He's got an incredibly long stride, definitely over 100% of body height. So his stride is smooth, long. He looks really smooth and easy coming down the mound, but the ball jumps off of his hand just because of his characteristics and his abilities. And then we've got Jimmy Herget, who's got an abnormally short stride. He probably strides under 75% of his body height, um, but absolutely is elite when it comes to developing velocity um, from the pitch. So it's a complex movement in itself, but when we also take into consideration um, how unique every athlete is, their, how they present and how um, the characteristics that they pitch with, um, it becomes even more complex. Um, and I am a strength coach, you know, I work in a gym every single day, so I need some ways to simplify this extremely complex um, concept and one way that I've found one illustration because my mind works better in pictures to kind of simplify this for myself as well as my athletes is actually um, a catapult or a trebuchet as this one is specifically referred to. So we're going to talk about how we can simplify the concept of rotational power. 
So here, hopefully I drew it big enough so you guys can all see it. Um, we've got an example of a catapult. Um, and so I kind of correlate each part of this catapult with a different part of the throwing motion or a different part of the body. So here we've got the base and it's ex extremely stable base. Um, trebuchets were first found in fourth century BC in China. So that, that's a technology that's been around for a long time. At first they were man powered, but then we found out if we added a counterweight, it would make it more efficient and definitely more powerful. So we have a massive counterweight here at the top on the short end of the lever arm um, connected through the fulcrum into the long lever arm and then you've got a sling which is attached to the rock or the throwing object um, and the biggest ones in the world could throw a 200 pound stone over 300 meters so absolutely had some great rotational power but I like to correlate this with different parts of the body when I'm thinking about the pitching motion. So number one, the counterweight, I like to think about that as the um, drive leg or the back leg. Number two, we've got the base here and I correlate that with the plant leg. And then number three, finally, we've got the lever arm and I correlate that with both the trunk and the upper body and the throwing arm. And I'll kind of come back to this as we get through the presentation and show you exactly um, what I mean by that. But I think that's a great way to kind of simplify it for athletes when we're explaining it to them and when we're um, trying to talk about basically what we need to prioritize or get out of our training when it comes to rotational athletes. So next, let's talk about the controllable factors. What exactly we can affect and control as strength and conditioning professionals when it comes to rotational athletes. So number one, I think their relationship with the ground. We can create a more forceful relationship with the ground and we can affect their gas, so their ground leg or their back leg, as well as their brake, so their lead leg, their plant leg. We can affect the efficiency of transfer through the trunk, so how that energy is being transferred. We can improve their upper body ballistic power, which we know correlates with a higher pitch velocity. We can improve their scapular function, so how that arm is delivered and how that scap works to deliver that arm. We can affect their sequence of their hip and shoulder separation, create a more efficient um, hip sequence or hip and shoulder sequence. And we can affect their body mass and cross-sectional area. We all love that as strength coaches. So first I want to talk about the gas. So we refer to the back leg or the drive leg um, as the gas quite often. And so now I want to talk about exactly what we're looking for, what the roles are of that back leg, and then finally how we can affect it. And so I like to just use visuals, right? I love looking at um, videos of pitchers who are successful, looking at what they do, and then in turn looking at how we can affect it. So when we're talking about the back leg, basically we want it to do two things. We want it to increase linear momentum going towards the target, and it needs to initiate pelvic rotation, right? So this is Noah Syndergaard, absolutely an elite um, pitcher. Dude throws gas, he's awesome, he's strong, he's a great athlete. And there's a few things we want to look at, at what he's doing within his pitching motion that kind of separates him from the average. So first what I want you guys to focus on is just the back shin. So I want you to focus on his right shin, right? So you'll notice when he goes to drive into that leg, he holds a vertical shin for as long as he possibly can. Right? As he's doing that, he's driving, abducting towards the plate and putting massive amounts of force into the ground. And so we'll see a lot of kind of lower level pitchers, people who aren't as good or maybe not as strong, so they're not strong enough to hold the positions, they'll kind of just fall with that knee. You'll see that knee cave instead of it, you know, hold that external rotation, hold that vertical shin and drive towards it. And what that allows him to do is hold onto that rotation, hold that pelvic rotation until the last minute and then whip the, that pelvis kind of around, right? So um, we see, we've seen this for decades. The first study came out, or the first study started to come out uh, maybe 20 years ago that correlated the amount of ground reaction forces we can produce with the back leg and pitch velocity. We see this with other rotational sports with javelin and cricket. We'll see that uh, basically their uh, ability to create velocity into their throw correlates with higher, um, higher pitch velocities or with, for them higher throwing of their implements. But we also see it with stride length. But baseball is a little bit different because obviously we can't have a run up to our, our pitch. Right? We need to create that triple extension just like any other power athlete but we need to do it in the frontal plane 
And so there's one other study that kind of indicates or shows what as strength and conditioning coaches we need to prioritize when it comes to power development. Um, and it's a study done by Graham Lehman. He did it for his master's thesis. And they were trying to find a correlation between lower body field tests and pitch velocity, right? So they looked at um, a multitude of tests. It was broad jump, vertical jump, um, different sprint tests. They did some med ball throws. They took their body weight. Um, and the only lower body field test that correlated at all with pitch velocity or had a high correlation was something like a height in or maybe you call it a speed uh, skater hop. But basically it was a lateral to medial single leg jump. So this, we basically know, we find from this study that power is plane specific. So when it comes to training a baseball player, we need to have them or create, help them to create elite power in the frontal plane as well as the transverse plane once we turn it into rotation. So a good way to think about the pitching motion is that we're creating power or force linearly, we're turning it into rotational power once we get it to the pelvis, and then it becomes linear again when we release that ball. Um, this is kind of the reason why you can see some baseball players have 15 inch vert jumps but still throw 95. Right, so they're kind of some weird birds. Uh, baseball players, if you work with baseball players, you know they're usually not great athletes. They're not all that um, well trained or have high training ages. Um, if you saw them walking down the street, you probably wouldn't think they're a professional athlete, but they can throw the ball at 95 miles an hour, so they're gonna get paid for it, right? Um, but when it comes to training, when we look at that study that showed us that power is plane specific, when we talk about training the gas, we need to understand that power is plane specific and prioritize frontal plane power development. Right? So absolutely we need to get these athletes more powerful in general. If you take a youth athlete who just can't jump at all, squat, run, if you just have him squat and hinge and you just get him a little bit stronger, it's going to have massive effects on his athletic capabilities. But when we look at more elite athletes, um, say someone like Matt Manning or Jimmy Herget, we need to make sure that we are prioritizing their ability to create power in the frontal plane. So at Hyperthrive, how we do that is we prioritize things like um, you know, like a lateral lunge, or maybe it's a lateral sled drag, um, and all kinds of jumps and plyometrics in the frontal plane. And really, we also need to consider that we cannot neglect the sagittal plane. So I think a lot of coaches will take that information and, oh, we're only doing frontal plane power. That's the only thing that works for baseball players. But you also need to appreciate and understand that's just one position on the field, and it's also just one part of the game. Right? So we have a pitcher, absolutely. He needs to be powerfully frontal plane. But there's also, you know, eight different positions that we're working on here, right? And those guys need to be able to field their positions. They need to be able to sprint. They need to be able to create power in every single plane. Um, so we absolutely cannot neglect the sagittal plane when it comes to training our baseball players. But as we get closer to the season and power development becomes more of our priority and we need to get more specific to their skills, we need to make sure that their training is reflecting that and that frontal plane power development is prioritized the closer we get to that competitive season. Season. And then so next, I want to talk about the brakes or the lead leg, right? Um, and this is where I think it gets extremely interesting when it comes to training baseball players is the brakes. And one thing I, I love this saying, um, kinetic energy is just like money. It's not only about how much you make, it's about how much you can keep. Right? So we, we see massively powerful athletes who can generate incredible amount of frontal plane power, but maybe they just can't produce or they can produce it but they can't save it and put it up the kinetic chain finally into the ball. So when we're talking about the brakes, um, this is a great example of someone who uses the brakes really, really well. This is Max Scherzer, um, awesome pitcher, definitely one of the best in the league, he's incredible. Um, and he is well known for having an aggressive bracing action on that front leg. So what I want you guys to look at first is that front knee. And so he hits the ground um, with just a small amount of flexion in that front knee, and then you'll see it actually drive backwards. He puts a massively large impulse into the ground, and if you look at his hip line, his belt buckle, it will actually stop and then rise back 
right? So this guy is putting an, a, a massive amount of force into the ground. Um, there was one study that found, uh, I think it was anterior ground reaction forces were 245% of body weight. And in that study, um, the average velocity was 78 miles an hour. This dude definitely doesn't throw 78 miles an hour. So we can assume that he's putting even more um, force into the ground as soon as he hits. And we also need to appreciate the amplitude of this movement. So in that same study where they found 245, so we know that the average velocity was 78 miles an hour, um, the amplitude of the movement from front foot contact, so the time it takes from front foot contact to ball release is only 145 milliseconds, right? 0.145 of a second. So we can assume with someone even more elite like him, that's gonna be an even lower number. It's an extremely fast movement, it's plyometric, um, and our training needs to reflect how fast that movement needs to occur. Right, so when we're talking about um, training the brakes, and I think this is just another incredible example. I just had to put this in there. Javelin throwers are crazy, um, but we can see that his, his front leg hits the ground in an already braced position. It's stiff immediately when he gets here. And when it comes to um, javelin throwers or pitchers, if we keep um, going forward with that knee, if we can't create that bracing action and we get more lead knee flexion as we go, we're leaking power, right? So that's power that we're leaking from all that momentum we created from the back leg. It's not being transferred up the kinetic chain. We can see it um, also in a golfer. You'll see the exact same thing. Look at his belt buckle. It will rise right when he hits the ground there. You'll see that front foot even pop off the ground. Um, so that same mechanism, that braking mechanism, goes across a ton of different sports. We can see it with all rotational athletes, um, the importance of creating that brace. So how to train the brakes? Uh, we know that we need to prioritize strength and stability in unilateral positions. When it comes to rotation, pretty much everything you do is gonna be unilateral. Especially baseball players, well, when it comes to any rotational athlete, they need to be strong in unilateral positions. So that has to be prioritized when it comes to your training. Right? So with our baseball players at Hyperthrive Athletics, they're gonna do a ton of lunge work. Um, we're gonna change the tempo on them. They need to be eccentrically and isometrically strong so that they can plant and drive and hit the brakes as hard as they possibly can when they take it to their sport-specific movement. We, uh, like I said, eccentric and isometric strength to create the base for rotation. So we need to stop our force going this way, but remember we already started to create that rotation. So um, the most rotation from the pelvis, the peak angular velocity of that pelvis happens prior to front foot contact. So when we hit the ground with that front foot, we're already rotating those hips at an incredible rate. So not only do I need to stop my momentum going this way, I I need to also stop my momentum going this way rotationally, right? So we need to consider that as well. So it's stopping our momentum going straight towards the plate, but also it needs to stop it rotationally with the hips. And like I said, we need to consider the amplitude of the movement, right? It's extremely fast, it's plyometric. Um, and one thing that I like to consider is early stage rate of force development versus late stage rate of force development. Um, it's right around 100 milliseconds, that's not a hard number, um, where it's determined by early stage rate of force development factors versus late stage, right? So we know in elite pitchers, it's probably even lower than 145 milliseconds, so our training needs to affect factors that affect early stage rate of force development. And what affects those things are one, tendon stiffness, we need to affect, um, and we need to affect neural firing rates, right? And so one thing that we use a lot at Hyperthrive is isometrics, right? So isometrics are great in improving tendon stiffness and also neural firing rates. Um, and one other thing that I really love about them, it allows us to key in on our critical joint angles, right? So we know for pitchers, you saw Max, if I go back, the front lead knee angle does not change all that much, right? So if I'm working in an isometric movement, I can attack exactly where he needs to be strong isometrically and eccentrically, right? And I think isometrics, one, work great because they help us to improve our early stage rate of force development factors, but we can also do it at critical joint angles like here, and if we see here, his lead knee flexion does not change all that much and neither does it with the golf, right? So I think isometrics are definitely one of the best things you can be using with your rotational athletes to create a better base and a better um, bracing force on that front leg. Uh, but also isometrics are just one part of the system, 
right? If we only did isometrics and we didn't include it into dynamic movements, we probably wouldn't get all that great of effect. So at Hyperthrive, we also have them do a ton of plyometrics off one leg, landing off one leg. Um, we need to consider that isometrics are going to absolutely benefit us, but it's an extremely dynamic movement once we get to our sport specific stuff. Um, so we need to progress it um, as such. And next I wanna talk about the trunk. I wanna talk about the trunk's role in um, actually producing that force or transferring that force. And I think when we talk about the trunk, um, when you first hear the trunk's role, when it comes to movement, everybody says stiffness, right? Um, I think Stu McGill says proximal stiffness allows for um, athletic ability, I, I don't exactly know how he says it, but at the extremities. Proximal stiffness creates athleticism at the extremities. And I think absolutely that's true. We need to develop proximal stiffness, but I think it also gives people the wrong idea about what um, the role is of the trunk. So absolutely, it's to create stiffness. But when you look at movements, like here, Josh Donaldson, he's not stiff the entire time there, right? If he was stiff the entire time and just holding, squeezing, he would not be able to create any hip shoulder separation. And if we look back to how we started the presentation, that's one of humans' um, unique capabilities that allows us to throw hard. So if, if core's job in rotational movements was just to remain stiff, wouldn't a chimpanzee be better at it? right, with that smaller pelvis, um, smaller gap between their thorax and their pelvis, they can definitely create some stiffness, but our ability to create that hip shoulder separation is what separated us from them. So we need to know that we not only need to create stiffness, but we need to be eccentrically strong, allow for that space to happen, allow for that separation to happen, and then use the stiffness once we get that separation to create the power, right? So it's not just about stiffness, it's about being eccentrically strong and allowing our body to work naturally like it was supposed to and then creating the stiffness. And it's all about the timing when it comes to that stiffness. And so our body works, um, there's a spiral architecture of the trunk that allows for us basically to bring our contralateral shoulder to our hip, right, to create that rotation. Whether you want to call it a serape or the spiral effect, um, whatever it is, our body works rotationally, right? So what you'll see with Josh Donaldson here is his shoulders, when his hips move, right, when they start to rotate, his shoulders are actually going in the opposite direction. So his posterior serape, what connects his right shoulder to his left hip, has to be strong enough to hold back, squeeze, hold those shoulders back until just the right moment and when he can snap those shoulders through and drop absolute bombs like this guy does. Right? So you see his shoulders are holding back, 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 hips are already rotating and then he lets all that power go. So when we're talking about training the rotational athlete, and this is another great um, example a hockey player obviously he can't create a massive breaking force on that front leg so one thing i want you to appreciate here and it goes um, with volleyball players as well anyone who doesn't have a strong base of support when they're rotating you'll actually see his hip right when his arms unleash and rotate his hips start to counter rotate the other way and that's kind of an example like let's say if you're going up for a hit in volleyball the second your shoulders go to rotate counterclockwise your hips start rotating the other way that's an example of how that trunk is grabbing on contralaterally to the pelvis and actually creating that rotation through that trunk musculature. I see a couple people doing it in the seat, right? You don't think about it, but when you go to hit, boom, I'm gonna start rotating, and without even thinking, those hips snap back in the other direction. And you can kind of see it in hockey players, and next time you watch a volleyball player, go ahead and watch that too. So when we're talking about how to train the trunk, absolutely stiffness first. If I get a young athlete or I get a general population client that we're working with, if we introduce stiffness to the system, most of the time we're gonna see great benefits, right? Kids do not know how to create stiffness. Um, a lot of people in our general population lack the ability to create stiffness, so absolutely stiffness first. But like I said, we also need to incorporate some movements that allow the shoulders and the hips to separate, and we need to train in every single plane of motion. Um, so this is one system, it's called the Octagon Training System. Um, it was by Santana, uh, he wrote a paper about it, and I think it's really an easy way to simplify, to make sure that we are training in every single plane of motion. So we see here we've got up, down, we've got, and I think a lot of um, people who work with baseball players, or you'll see baseball players doing it, they're only creating rotation in the same plane of movement that their sport specific skills happen in, right? But we know that 
they have to decelerate that, right? So we have to go in the opposite direction. Um, we know that torque can be improved in two ways. We can improve the force from the agonist, and we can also um, stop the inhibition from the antagonist, right? So our ability to decelerate is gonna improve our ability to accelerate, because our body knows exactly how much gas it has, but it also knows exa exactly how much brakes it has, right? So if it doesn't feel comfortable stopping a movement, it's not gonna allow you to accelerate into that movement. So like I said, we need to train the ability to stiffen and to separate. Right? So if you are only doing anti-movements, so anti-rotation, anti-extension, all that, which I think is great, but you also need to consider the fact that our unique ability to create separation, be strong in those separated positions, is what separates us and what allows us to create that rotational power. Um, we also need to involve the upper and the lower halves. Right? So if you're only doing tall kneeling payoff press, half kneeling payoff press, something that's ground-based, that's great, but everything they do in their sport is from their feet. Right? And everything they do in their sport also has to incorporate the upper body to finish the movement. So we need to know that, understand that, and progress as such. Obviously, we want to introduce stability at first. So if a kid has no stability on his feet, okay, let's take him to tall kneeling, progress him to half kneeling, get him standing. Then we can even go into some split stance position, something like that to challenge the stability. Um, but we need to involve the upper and the lower halves. That's why I love stuff that are like rotational rows or maybe a rotational landmine press that incorporates the entire body, the upper half and the lower half. And then we also need to think about when it comes to um, programming for athletes, is we need to complement and not compete. So we need to look at what these athletes are doing outside of the, the weight room. Um, obviously we can control what stressors we place on them, but we can't control what they're doing in their practice majority of the time. In some scenarios, yes you can, um, but with a lot of youth athletes, it's, it's a tough, tough thing to do, right? So if, a, if an athlete at any stage is going and taking 200 swings a day and he's also throwing for you know, 20 minutes, do you think that your chops are gonna affect his rotational capabilities on top of that? Probably not. Probably three sets of 10 per side is probably not gonna do much. It's not much of a stressor on top of what he's already doing. So as we get closer to the season, right, most people would think, okay, let's get sports specific, incorporate more rotation. Man, they're already swinging 300 times a day. So maybe now is when we need to really prioritize anti-rotation, what they're not doing already in their sport, right? They already know how to swing. They're already doing it with max intent, I can guarantee that. So we need to understand that and complement and not compete with what they're already doing. Then we want to talk about the upper half. So um, I think the tides have turned on this a little bit, but it was not too long ago that baseball players were not supposed to lift with their upper body, right? Um, and ab absolutely, the tides have turned. People are starting to, you'll see some jacked baseball players now, which I love. Um, but we still see a lot of high school baseball players that come in and can't do a single body weight push-up, right? If you work with baseball players, you know what I'm talking about. These kids are not very strong. Um, it's a part of the culture in football, other sports, that um, weight training, they're doing push-ups in that football practice, I can guarantee you that. But if you go to a baseball practice, you're not gonna see many push-ups, right? So we need to make sure that we're prioritizing the upper half. So upper body power correlates with throwing velocity. We know that pretty well. It's been studied, it's been shown, upper body power absolutely correlates with our ability to throw and our ability to create ballistic power. Uh, but when we're talking about baseball players, these guys make their money on their shoulders, right? So we need to absolutely spare the shoulders and cho choose your tools wisely. And I think there's kind of two camps in baseball as far as strength and conditioning. There's people that like bench press, and there's people that absolutely hate bench press, right? And there's definitely conversation and kind of conflict that happens. Um, and people love to be black and white about things. Um, I do think there's a middle ground. I can tell you at Hyperthrive Athletics, it's very rare that you are going to see a baseball player um, barbell bench press, right? I am going to spare the shoulders as much as I possibly can when it comes to baseball players, and I don't think that's going to affect my ability to create upper body power with my athletes. It's a tool, I'm going to choose other tools. If you wanna have that conversation, I would absolutely love to have it. I think there is definitely some cases where I would allow that, you know, if they had the mobility and they had the prerequisites mobility to do it and maybe they had already done it they have the skill that's great but I really think there's other tools that we can choose that are a little bit better 
And so um, kind of one thing that we need to think about here is power is important, but so is scapular function and rotator cuff stability. So there's one statistic that I love, um, and it was basically, it showed that a 20% decrease in power created from the trunk or from the lower body and the trunk, if we have a 20% decrease in that power moving up to the upper extremity because of scapular dysfunction, the internal rotation of the shoulder has to make up for, for that by 34%, right? So if we lose 20% of the energy we created in our um, lower half because our scap can't deliver our arm correctly, we have to make up for it 34% in the shoulder. Right? If we're talking about sparing the shoulder and putting as little stress as we possibly can on the shoulder, we need to know that scapular function is important not only for health, but for performance. Right? Um, so at Hyperthrive, uh, this is kind of something that my mindset has changed on a little bit. Um, I think that people kind of attack scapular function maybe in not the best way. So you'll see in a lot of baseball facilities, you'll go, you'll see wall slides, um, you'll see a lot of things like I love uh, serratus anterior work, but you see a ton of movements that are not all that dynamic, right? Like a wall slide compared to a guy throwing a ball at 95 miles an hour, there's a massive gap between those two, right? And I think one thing we need to appreciate is that the scap's only osseous connection to the axial skeleton is through the collarbone, right? So it's, it's floating. Right? And it has um, that connection, uh, basically that convex, concave relationship. It sits right on top of our rib cage, and we want that to have a great relationship and stick to that rib cage really, really well. But we also need to consider that the scap is reacting to what the upper back is doing, to what our T-spine is doing, right? So if you're having scapular dysfunction, I don't think you should look at the scap. I think you first need to look at the T-spine. Right? Because the scap is just reacting to what is going on in the upper back. Right? So I think a movement that I'm really a fan of is kettlebell work, like kettlebell Turkish get-ups. Um, I'll have some humility on this. Like, if you would have asked me at the beginning of my career, I'd be like, that's a party trick. That's, I don't know about that. I don't know about that Turkish get-up thing. But when we consider what it's actually doing is it is forcing our scap to react dynamically to what's going on, one, with the implement, right at the end of the extremity but it's also reacting to what's going on in the t-spine and really challenging its ability to know what's going on on both ends so i think that's um it's kind of changed my perception of the scaps um, abilities right how how we actually function with it but then also how we want to train it and so next, I want to talk about optimizing our med ball work, which is probably what you guys all expected from a rotational power um, presentation, so I'll get to it. So with our med ball work, I absolutely think that medicine balls are great at enhancing rotational power. It's been studied, they're awesome, right? They enhance rotational power. But I also think they're an underestimated to tool for a couple of different things. First one is motor learning, and then teaching and allowing intent. Right? So when we talk about motor learning, uh, if you guys are familiar with the constrained action hypothesis, basically it shows us that if an athlete is internally focused, they are going to exert less power. Right? So if I'm focused on what my body is doing, I'm not going to be able to be as powerful as I can. And most of the studies are done um, when it comes to sprints, but I think it absolutely can apply to medicine ball work and to baseball players. And one reason I really believe that is because if you watch a baseball player go and and swing in the cages, they'll be doing this for 30 minutes. You'll even see it in their lift. They'll stop in a lift, and right? So they are so worried about their mechanics that I think they are extremely internally focused. So how can we ask them to be powerful if they are so focused on nailing these mechanics and everybody talking about mechanics over and over and over again? And I think one way to do that is we just throw a medicine ball in their hands instead of a bat. Right? Now they're not nearly as concerned with the outcome or with the mechanics and their body is going to be able to naturally self-organize, be an athlete and throw that ball as hard as they can. Right? And I think it really is great for allowing intent because just like I said, they're so worried about their mechanics, they're not worried about being powerful. So really when we um, have our med ball work, and we'll kind of show you guys some of the things we do in our practical, but I want competition and I want you to be athletic. Right? I am not going to give you a ton of cues, I'm going to give you some constraints and give you the drills that are going to kind of get the result I want and I'll show you some of the ways I do that in the practical, but I want you to be an athlete first and foremost and I want you to try to throw that ball through the wall. Right? That is the number one goal, intent, intent, intent. 
And then how we potentiate our med ball work, um, I think this is something that we've implemented recently and I think we're getting really great results out of it. Um, one, we want to potentiate the rate limiting factor. So in pitching, we understand that the rate limiting factor is the lead leg's ability to create a bracing action and continue that energy going up the kinetic chain. So I think it only makes sense that we potentiate that lead leg. And now I go back to that isometric work we were talking about and the critical joint angles. I think it gives us um, kind of two things here. We get two things out of it. One, we can use those isometrics to potentiate that lead leg so they feel what it feels like to produce force with that front leg. But then and also, um, it'll basically allow our athletes to feel what that critical joint angle feels like. And I think a lot of times people miss the boat on medicine ball work when you'll see people doing medicine ball work and that's how they finish, right? You'll see an athlete throw that medicine ball and they just keep all their power going with them. I'm going to cue you to hit the brakes as hard as you possibly can with that front leg. And I think that cue is probably better than anything when it comes to med ball work. I want you to absolutely brace as hard as you can with that front leg. So if we allow them to feel what the position feels like in our isometric work, then they will definitely be able to feel that better. And so what we do most of the time is we'll do a split stance overcoming isometric hold, right? Sometimes we'll have it, um, have them hold it for five to 10 seconds. We'll allow two to three minute rest in between, and then they'll go straight into their med ball work. We'll do three to four sets just like that. If you have questions about that, I would love to talk about that. Um, so like I said, it allows us to potentiate key positions. Another thing you can do is potentiate antagonists or co-contractors. So this is something we haven't used as much, but I've definitely talked to other strength coaches about and they've found success, is if you potentiate the antagonist, um, you can see some great results in the medicine ball work. So an example of this would be having your athletes do some heavy rows, right? So we're potentiating that posterior sling and then have them go into their medicine ball throws. So our body can feel comfortable with its ability to break that accelerated force, right? And then lastly, I wanna encourage competition. Right. We do not have a radar gun on our wall. I wish we did, but there is something awesome about the sound a medicine ball makes when it hits a wall. Right? Oh, I love that. When you get a good little smack against the wall. So I, I encourage our athletes to basically be competitive about how they're throwing that med ball. And I want them egging each other on, right? At some point in my facility, I do want a radar gun on our wall so we ha can have that competitive ability. And like Max talked about, they're gonna be able to feel what a great, um, what a great rep feels like, right? They're gonna know, okay, oh, that was good. That's what that felt like. So it's gonna give them immediate feedback about what they're doing. But I do want them to be extremely competitive when it comes to their medicine ball work. So that is my presentation. We're gonna talk a lot more about our medicine ball work when we go to our practical and also some frontal plane mechanics that we work with with our baseball players. But really guys, I just want to thank you guys for your time and for your attention. This was an incredible opportunity. I really, really appreciate it. I hope that each and every one of you gets a chance to come and talk to me, ask me any questions. I want to meet you guys. I want to talk about this. Um, if it can be improved, what you guys think, what you guys liked, what you guys will use on Monday. Um, but really, honestly, Thank you guys so much. We do have uh, time for at least one question, so. baseball players it's it could be seen as taboo you kind of hinted at it with the with the barbell bench press but I mean how about you talk a little bit about overhead overhead work whether it's pulls pushes etc yeah. etc what you what you try to avoid like you talk about the tools absolutely you know, um, tool so that is one thing that I think I, I did miss is um, we want to use tools that both increase our athletes power capabilities in the upper body but at the same time can help to increase maybe some of that upper rotation of the scap so I think something like a landmine press is a great tool um, I don't think that athletes need as much variation as we as coaches like to think right like we like to give them variation and throw different things at them but if I have let's say um, four months, five months with an athlete, I can basically give him a half kneeling 
uh, progression to start, then I'll go standing, then I'll go split stance, then I'll go rotational with that landmine press. And honestly, I think landmine presses are great, but push-up variations, right? Like I said, baseball players really aren't that trained in the first place. Let's get them to do a quality push-up, get some good scapular function with those push-ups, um, and we can load push-ups really, really well, right? Um, so I think it's on us not to be chasing just numbers when it comes to like a bench press or um, the weights that they're lifting, but really consider what's best for the athlete in that moment. And I think variations like a landmine press um, or some push-up variations, and I would rather go with a dumbbell bench press if I'm gonna go with anything. Um, but I do think that definitely they need to be strong in overhead positions. I don't think you should avoid overhead positions with athletes. I think that's kind of something that people do. It's like, oh, they're baseball players, they're overhead. Like, don't go overhead with them. No, they need to be strong overhead. Let's make sure that they're strong and stable in those positions. Um, I'm not afraid to load up my athletes when it comes to overhead positions, but we also need to consider their ability to just get into an overhead position before we do that. So I think we take care of that in our assessment and make that call with each individual athlete. Nice, good work, Joe. Really appreciate it. One more time, y'all.